So I'm fortunate to be having a lot of conversations about learning engineering lately. Um, and a lot of folks are looking at this notion of learning engineering as one way to gain some traction in what we see as some pretty real challenges in post-secondary education, both here in the US, but also more globally. Through these conversations, um, you've got a lot of questions. Do we actually need learning engineers? What is a learning engineering approach? Maybe a little bit of pushback around this idea. So isn't this just instructional design? And uh, don't we already have professionals that do this work? Um, but one common theme through these conversations has been some sense that learning engineering is new, that it's an emerging discipline. And so what I wanted to do was talk a little more about the history of learning engineering. Um, we've been thinking a lot about history here at Carnegie Mellon. We were fortunate to just celebrate the 50th anniversary of the merger between what was then Carnegie Technical Institute and the Mellon College of Science to become what's now Carnegie Mellon University. So we've had a lot of events on campus. Uh, I've been hearing a lot about that time. And so I'd like to take you back to 1967 where Simon Initiative namesake, Herb Simon, uh, working at the Graduate School of Industrial Administration, GSIA, where there's an awful lot happening, where we're seeing the first movements of the development of a school of, or excuse me, of a department of computer science that's eventually going to become the modern school of computer science. Simon is deeply involved in this work. He's also continuing with some of his own research around psychology and around emerging insights into organizational behaviors. What we hear from students that write about this time period is something that they're referring to as a quiet period of rebellion, where the students are pushing back on the structure of the curriculum, eventually end up uh, actually seeing some real changes in how we approach graduate education here at CMU. And Simon's involved in all of these, but in the midst of all of this, he finds a little bit of time to offer some advice to college presidents on how to do their jobs. And what he zeroes in on very quickly is the important role that the university plays in learning. That this piece of the work, as distinct from research, is one of the tasks that the president needs to take very, very seriously. Sort of this interesting note straight off the bat is this concern about what he sees as the amateurism that's present in the learning space at the university, something that was true 50 years ago. And it's interesting because we're still having these conversations about how we can better professionalize the work of teaching and learning uh, here at Carnegie Mellon, but also across the post-secondary space. While he's talking, he proposes, uh, in fact, he invents an entirely new profession, that of the learning engineer. So what, is, what does he describe as learning engineer? What's the work? He sees this as someone that's going to be working closely with faculty, though not necessarily subordinate to them. Someone that's going to be an expert in research, uh, specifically what he calls educational psychology, but that we now think of a little more as learning science. What we see in his descriptions are emerging themes of evidence, of a data-driven approach, of an approach that's going to allow us to iterate upon learning experiences, keep making them better and better. And he talks about the importance of thinking not just about what happens in an exercise or in a classroom, but about the entire learning environment, which he thinks of as the entire university. And so 50 years ago, what we see is Simon really proposing this work and defining this work, the, uh, this, this idea of a learning engineer. So why do I raise this? I mean, on the one hand, I raise it for pride. I'm actually very proud of the home that learning engineering has here at Carnegie Mellon. But I also raise it because we have an ongoing challenge in educational technology that we in EdTech are very frequently forgetful of our histories. Uh, everybody wants to be a new explorer planting a flag and not always paying a lot of attention to folks that have already passed through this direction or the folks that have been living there all along. And so let's think a little more about what kinds of things have been going on in learning engineering. When you look ahead, Simon starts to make this work of the improvement of learning in post-secondary space really core to his research. Um, and he puts out a challenge to his colleagues that if we were going to really fundamentally improve what's happening in learning in colleges and universities, we need to start treating it as a research activity. That uh, you know, the, the time of one lone person standing up here talking at you the way that I am, we've probably taken as far as we can. And so if we're going to treat it as research, it needs to be research that we think about as being as rigorous and as important as the work that we're doing in our own domain. One of the things that makes CMU interesting is that we don't have a college of education. And so this work really happens and springs up at places all across the university. We had a recent visitor to the university note that um, rather than having a college of education, he sees Simon's challenge as suggesting that we should be treating 
Every classroom in our university is a college of education. The opportunity to be doing deep research with every faculty member a learning scientist. And I think that that's a really beautiful vision. And that at core is what we see as the mission of the Simon Initiative. And so in many ways, when we think about how we approach learning engineering at Carnegie Mellon, we're starting with what's a pretty Simon-esque notion, that learning is not something you can observe because it happens in the human brain. And so we need to build models of what we think is happening, use those models to design the kinds of practices that we can see, that we can observe. And from those observations, we're able to refine our models and refine what we think is happening inside of those brains. That model building is really central to how we approach learning engineering because it's what's going to be connecting the work that's happening in the learning sciences with the kind of innovation and practice that we want to see, whether it's in the classroom, on an online course, or with a cognitive tutor. That that ongoing theory of learning is going to be what influences both our model design and the design of our learning experiences, but that we're going to instrument those experiences so that they're producing data, data that we can use to refine the experience to make it better, and that in the aggregate, we can push back into the learning sciences to answer fresh questions, to really advance how we understand humans to learn. So when we think about what distinguishes the work of a learning engineer from the work of an instructional designer, part of it is this data component. But I think equally important, because there's certainly some design elements that you're seeing here, is that this is not a one-way trip. It's the virtuous cycle that you see, where the learning engineer is going to have some understanding of what are the spaces that are still left that we need to investigate? How can we conduct research and get that back into the larger learning community? One more history lesson for you. We'll talk a little bit about the emergence of the software crisis three decades ago, because I think there's some remarkable parallels to some of the educational challenges that we face today. If you look at the state of software in the late 70s to early 80s, we um, see roughly half of all software projects failing. Either they're not doing what they were intended to do, they are costing too much money, they never finish, they end up being bug filled and just unusable. And this is at a point where software is becoming increasingly important in modern life and where everyone recognizes that it's going to just become more and more essential as time continues. So in the face of this was a proposal for a, a new domain, what they're referring to as software, en software engineering. So the idea being that we can take an engineering approach to the development of software in ways that are going to make it more robust, more repeatable, uh, really make it more predictable as well. So if we're able to leverage and apply the sciences, we end up with a virtuous cycle in the space of software development where we'll just keep getting better at it. What's interesting is that this came under a lot of criticism at the time, this notion that um, we didn't actually need to define this as an engineering domain, uh, that, that engineering was something different, but also that this kind of work was already represented among software developers, that we had software designers, that we had architects. And yet 30 years later, uh, we clearly see the importance of software engineering and of the impact that this work has had on the field. These criticisms sound eerily familiar to some of the criticisms that we currently hear about in learning engineering. And what's interesting there is that uh, Simon anticipated these. He really recognized that attempting to professionalize this work was not going to be a task that could be taken on without any resistance. Um, I think that in a lot of ways, these criticisms miss the boat, sort of uh, focusing on the trees and missing the forest in the sense that far too often when we're criticizing this notion of learning engineering, it's criticizing the work that's taking place down at the level of improving an individual activity, making a test better, maybe even improving what's happening in the classroom. But the larger work of learning engineering actually needs to stretch across the institution and really take seriously um, you know, what we think of as the core purpose of a liberal arts education, which is not skills building or given specific domain expertise, but it's the training of citizens. And that happens across the entirety of the institution. And so thinking about this work as a cross-campus project, which is very specifically what Simon was imagining uh, part of the work of a learning engineer to be, is something that's pretty important. So, 50 years later, uh, what we've seen is just an emergence of a remarkable collection of tools and projects really impact in this learning engineering space, ranging from cognitive tutors to virtual peers, deep work into educational data mining, new advances in open education. 
And it's work that continues today, that we see new projects that we're taking on to really dive in and try to explore how we can improve writing and communication at the institution, new insights that are happening in research, and through it all, a reminder that this is not just a technical problem to be solved, that we really need to think about the larger work of learning engineering as a socio-technical system that honors and improves the human element of these systems as well. So it's been a really exciting time, and we're looking to continue to expand this work and its impact, not just here at CMU, but in collaboration with other institutions and in partnership with other organizations. If this work of learning engineering is something that's interesting to you, I think there's a lot of opportunity to learn more about it. Uh, we currently have a master's program called Metals that I think is offering the only work in learning engineering in the country. Um, you can jump onto our website and learn more. You can also head to the Simon website, and there you're going to be able to find what some of the new advances and new tools and technologies are. You'll be able to find different pieces of the ecosystem, things that you can take advantage of right now, and you'll be able to identify opportunities to get more involved with this community, to collaborate and partner with CMU, and help us to really fundamentally improve teaching and learning across this space.